Episode 6, Who's Making Love? Sex and Spirituality. We're looking at a, tr a true issue in our community, sexuality, which almost never gets addressed. Religion addresses it through morals, and we've all seen through that. Culture addresses it. And as the culture addresses it, the definitions change and what's appropriate changes. We know that in ancient Greece, sexuality had completely different relationships than it does now. So we're going to look first at this making love because the problem of calling it making love is really a core issue in our community. And as I said, that the Persians have many names for different kinds of love, just like the Eskimos had different names for the different kinds of snow. So if we didn't have the names the Eskimos did, you just see snow. But if you have all these fine distinctions, you see something deeper, you see something more complex. And so if the Persians have a different name, and let's say we had a different name for the love between a mother and a child, and a different name for the love between siblings. And a different name for the love between lovers. And a different name for the love between secret lovers, which the Persians have. If we had a different name for all the different qualities of what we call loving relationships, that would bring enormous clarity. But we have it all lumped into this generic love word, and then making love. Now, I came out of the 60s, as many of you on this call did, and if you didn't, you know about it. We had free love, and we had make love, not war. And we did, and I did. And we all made love with each other. Except what was made was pleasure for sure. We all had a lot of pleasure, felt good. Babies, often, families, often, and almost always suffering. No love was made. Pleasure, babies, families, suffering. Why is that if we were making love, we weren't living loving lives? Why weren't we living in happiness and love if we were making love all the time? Maybe we weren't making love. So we know that the purpose, I asked my teacher once, I said, Papaji, well, what, what's the purpose of sex? He said, to make babies. I said, well, why does it feel so good? He said, so you'll do it. And that is so simple and clear and true. And so what happens is, we are run by our genes. What we find pleasant, what we find unpleasant, is all genetic. What we like, what we don't like, what we're attracted to, the desire to make babies, it's all genetic. Because the genes are programmed to pass on. We are mortal, but the genes are relatively immortal. The genes that are living in each one of our cells have been passed on since the cosmic sea, since the one-celled creatures, it's the same DNA. It grows, it changes, it modifies, but it's the same. So the DNA has this impulse to reproduce, and we are the vehicles for the reproduction of DNA. So why is it that it feels so good so that we'll do it? And why is it when we make love when we have sex, there's a bonding that can happen. So in my experience, in the moment of orgasm, there's an openness. You're blown open in that moment. And when both partners are blown open, there's a possibility of emotional limbic bonding. And when that happens, it's called falling in love. When we fall in love with someone, we're not falling in love with the person that's there. We're falling in love with our projection onto that person. 
what we see. We see their beauty. We see their whatever it is that we love. We see their body or their whatever it is we find lovable and attractive is what we will see. And as we've all had the experience, after falling in love wears off, the other person shows up. And you had no idea. There's someone else here with different ideas, different attitudes, different beliefs, different tastes. They're very different from the one that you thought you fell in love with. And often that's when relationships break up. The point of the projection for the genetics is that we will mate and have a baby. And then, if we're having limbic bonding, we'll stay together long enough to raise the baby. That's this genetic scheme. Have babies, stay together, raise the babies. Then you can die, and the babies will grow up. Have babies, stay together, and die. That's the purpose, to have family. The purpose to have family is to reproduce genetics. And then we put our whole cultural overlay on that. We romanticize it. We call it falling in love. And I had someone recently say to me, you know, I'm so open when, I'm in, when I make love with a man. I'm truly there, and I feel betrayed over and over again, and I don't understand why. It's very simple. Because you're calling it making love. But you're not making love. You're having sex. It may feel good. It may be pleasurable. There may be some emotional bonding in it. And that emotional bonding can be broken. And when it's broken, it's painful. And this is where the suffering comes from. When we break the emotional bonds of the limbic brain, it causes us pain, and it causes pain to the both ends of the emotional connection. That's where our suffering comes from. So, cheating. Different cultures deal with sexual cheating, of course, in different ways. In some cultures, you get stoned to death. And the reason you would get stoned to death if you have cheating is because you need to establish paternity so that the man knows he's bringing food home to his genes. We call it to his child, to his daughter, to his son. It's to his genes. That's the point. I am passing on my genes, and I will protect my genes, and I want my genes to grow and to pass it on to their genetic offspring. And so since it's all about the genes, paternity is really important. In some cultures, you get stoned to death. There's a beautiful movie that... <clears throat> I think Richard Attenborough does, or it's David Attenborough, one of those brothers, does great nature films. And one of them, he does The Life of Birds. And there's an English barn swallow that's supposed to be monogamous, but cheats. When the partner isn't around, the female will have other lovers. Lovers. Other sex partners. When the male comes back, he pecks at her sex organs until she ejects the semen of the one she just had sex with, then he'll mount her and make sure his semen is inside of her. That's all about making sure you're taking care of your own babies. But since the one she cheated with thinks it's his, he'll also provide food to the nest. And so this is a genetic advantage. In cheating, she's bringing in multiple fathers to provide for her children, which is a genetic advantage. And he's making sure it's his by pecking at her until she ejects the semen. It's the brilliance of nature. One of the most interesting cultural patterns around sex that I've seen is in a book called Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. It's a book about a tribe in the Amazon, a tribe that hasn't been contacted much, that is still living basically as they've been living for a thousand years. A missionary goes to this tribe because they want to get a dictionary of their language in order to write a Bible to convert them. In his 10 years of studying them, to try to figure their language out, because it's really unique, he ends up realizing that they have a better life than any Christian he knows. They're happier, they're better adjusted, and he gives up Christianity. 
But along the way, while he's learning from them, one day he goes into his friend's house, and his friend is lying with his head in his partner's lap. And when he tries to pick his head up, the, his friend's wife has him by the hair and pulls him back down and laughs and, he, and hits him with a little club, not to hurt him, but just to hit him, and laughs. They both laugh. And it turns out he'd made love with another woman, and this happens a lot in this tribe. Sometimes it doesn't matter, it just gets passed over. But if it does matter, in this case it did, she holds him all day in her lap, and every time he tries to move, she hits him. Sometimes in the face, sometimes in the body, not to hurt him, but just hits him, and they both laugh. And after a day of this, it's over, and they go on about their lives. So that's the way one culture deals with cheating or infidelity. Our monogamy, or our lack of monogamy, is genetic. Some creatures are genetically wired for monogamy, others aren't. But what's interesting is there's a study done with, in the Western United States, there's a creature called a vole, which lives in little like prairie holes in the ground. And there are two kinds of voles. There are mountain voles and there are prairie voles. One of those is monogamous and the male will stay around and help raise the family. The other one, not monogamous, and the male does not stick around and doesn't raise the family. Two different subsets of the same species. When they took the genetic information from one and put it into another, it switched. The one that was monogamous was no longer monogamous. The one that wasn't monogamous became monogamous. It was a genetic piece of DNA that made the difference. So some of us are wired for monogamy, some of us aren't. But it becomes a morality issue rather than an emotional issue. Morality has nothing to do with it. It's really about not causing pain, not causing suffering. I was just in a group recently, and I asked the people in the group, everybody who's ever masturbated, stand up. The whole group stood up. I said, if you've ever had sex with more than one partner, stand up. The whole group stood up. A hundred years ago, nobody would admit it if they did, and most of them hadn't. This has changed because the culture has changed. I also asked them, how many people have uh, had partners that were the same sex? Many people stood up. Your sexual orientation is also genetic. And you know, the culture, most cultures celebrate genetic, cultural, sexual diversity. In some cultures, the gay men are considered closer to the spirit and have different gifts. Our culture, the Christians, try to change it behaviorally, but it's genetic. And we know that now, and we accept it. So that's a huge change in our society, in our cultural understanding. But really, what does this have to do with anything is that it's all made up. Everything we've laid on top of this genetic reproduction is the story we tell about it. And different cultures tell different stories and have different outcomes. So my partner and I, when we first started, this is our 40th year together, 40th anniversary. Neither of us ever expected that. When our relationship first started, we, were, we met at a party in Berkeley, 1975. When we first started, we met in a party in Berkeley in 1975. I was 28 years old. I was living with a woman. We had an open relationship. And she brought her lover to this party. And he brought a date. And so I certainly wanted to make love with his date. And so I did my courting, courtship ritual, my plumage display. I followed her around the party reciting my poetry. <laughs> and she didn't get it. She said, what, you know, this 
kid in overalls, looks like Jerry Garcia in overalls, following her around reciting poetry that she didn't understand. But in those days, it was almost like everyone was making love. Everyone was making love. And so we had sex, and it was very good. And our sexual relationship brought us together initially. And then it deepened. And then she fell in love. And eventually I fell in love. And the great good luck of our relationship is that we didn't match each other's ideal. I am not what she would be looking for in a man in any way. Size, shape, personality, appearance. And she's not what I would have been looking for. And I wasn't looking for a mate. I was, I knew I wasn't going to have children. I was a confirmed bachelor, you could say. I was very happy living a solitary life. I was on a mission, I was on a spiritual mission, and I didn't want to be dragged down. I didn't want to have to carry someone else along with me. I didn't want to have kids. I didn't want to have a relationship. I was one pointed in my direction. But when I fell in love, and when she fell in love, we fell in love with something deeper than the surface. It wasn't her body that I fell in love with, although it was beautiful. It wasn't her personality. It was her soul. I could see her soul and through her eyes, and she saw mine. And that's how we've stayed together for 40 years. Our bodies have changed. Our personalities have changed. We've had our ups and downs. We've tried an open relationship. And what was interesting in the open relationship, I, of course, was the one who promoted it, is that when she would go out and have a lover, I would feel jealous. I didn't want to. I knew that was not politically correct. I mean, I promoted open relationship. I wanted her to do it so I could do it. But I could feel the pain of her having sex with somebody else. That was the first inkling that I had that there was something deeper going on here, that it was a limbic emotional connection that was not in the conscious mind. So that even though conscious mind, I knew better than to feel jealous, I felt jealous anyway. So that was our first clue, you could say. And as our relationship matured, as our partnership matured, really, you know, people talk about working on their relationship. I don't know what that means. But I know that we were willing to tell the truth to each other. And in being willing to tell the truth to each other, as hard as it would be, it allowed something deeper to open. And what we would notice is if we were starting to carry resentments, we'd build up a story that we weren't telling the other one, but that we would talk to ourselves. You know what I'm talking about. You wouldn't say it out loud, but you kind of feel it and think it, and then hide it, and then make believe it's not there. Well, when that would build up, there'd be friction, and the fights would happen never about that, but about something inconsequential. And the inconsequential fights were a signal there's something else going on here. So we'd sit down together, and we'd uncover it. We'd tell the truth to each other. We'd say what the secret behind the scenes story was, and we'd hear it without judgment. That was one of the great good luck things that happened for us, is that we would sit with each other, one person would say everything that they didn't like for 10 minutes. The other person would then say everything they didn't like about the other. And then we'd switch, everything you do like, everything you do like, no comments. No justification. When my partner would say something she didn't like about me, the tendency would be to say, yeah, but, no, well. But we didn't do that. We just let it sit so she could just express it. And that was so useful. This is a little secondary aside. But really, the true teaching here is, my partner said to me once, you know, we have a bigger mission here. She had taken on my mission for freedom, to bring the world to peace, to find true freedom. She said, we have a bigger mission here, and we can't waste our time and our energy 
on all this emotional upset. And she was right. All the acting out, all the uh, sexual stuff was distracting us from our essential purpose in life. And so that's really where the question of sex and spirituality comes in. Sex is not spiritual, and it's not not spiritual. It really has nothing to do with that. But what is useful is it can be a useful tool, or it can be an impediment. If your sexual, emotional upsets are useful, you use them to penetrate to the truth, to see more deeply into who's here, who's invested in what, what you want, what you're trying to get, what you're avoiding. And in that way, it's a teaching tool. If, on the other hand, it becomes the distraction of your life and you spend all your time in your emotional warfare, sexual warfare, you've distracted yourself from life, from the bigger picture. You're staying very small. So really the question here is about identity. The real question is who's making love? So making love, we know, doesn't really work. It's not an accurate term for what's happening. But who is making love? And then if you go in to examine that and you go, oh, nobody, there's no one here. It's not that. It's not nobody, there's no one here. It's who's making love? I am. What do I want? What am I trying to get? What am I trying to keep? What am I trying to keep away? This is where we examine ourselves. This is where character develops. This is the possibility. So, sex or no sex really doesn't matter. Celibacy never brought anyone to enlightenment. I was very lucky when I met my teacher. My sex chakra closed down and for 12 years I was celibate. I loved it. All the energy that had gone into my sexual stuff went into my service of my teacher. It was blissful. I loved it. And then it ended, as all states end. But it showed me something. It showed me the possibility of using our energy in focus on something more important than our own personal. So, here we are. Our old world order is collapsing. Our society has collapsed. It started, I'd say, with Kennedy's assassination, the loss of the war in Vietnam, which never was acknowledged in the American psyche. One of the things I notice when I'm in Germany is that the German people have had to confront Nazism in their family, in themselves. And in that, there's been a deepening of, a deepening. The American culture in never having to come to terms with Vietnam. The culture was wounded and it festered. And then you have the Reagan right-wing counter-revolution against the humanist uprising that was happening. And Reagan brings in the greed is good philosophy that inevitably leads us to the demagogue of Donald Trump, a sexual misogynist. Whether Donald Trump wins or loses, it's a signal, and not only is it a signal of the decline, but it's accelerating the decline. It's accelerating the fragmentation of our culture. And that's painful, it's horrifying. And it also is the opening of something new that can be born. And this is where you come in. As we said in the 60s, will we be part of the problem or part of the solution? To be part of the solution is the willingness to give yourself fully the investigation of who you are, where you are, what you are. And when you realize that, to give yourself fully to the service of life, to the service of Mother Earth, 
to the service of love. That's why we're here. That's what makes sense of everything. From the one-celled being to your life, to my life. It all can end here in love. Otherwise, it's an endless cycle of reproduction and death. And we can see the world is not sustainable at this way. So, human life, who knows how much longer it has. We know the dinosaurs died out, life continued. We know there have been other catastrophes that wiped out most of the life forms on Earth, but it continued. Human life gets wiped out, the Earth will continue. So this is a brief moment we have. We don't know how much longer we have. But what will you give it to? How will you serve? That's really what we're here for. And if your sexual stuff is taking up your time and energy, check it out. See if it's worth it. Because really, that's all I'm interested in. I don't care what your sexual orientation is or what your sexual practices might be. I only care that you find out who you are and give yourself to the truth of yourself so that you can be free, so there's one less spot of suffering on Mother Earth. Well, Stefan has a question. Oh, hello. Hello, Eli. Hello, Stefan. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for these calls. They're so giving so much clarity, and I really love it. And I feel react to it, and I always. Uh, it's a great experience to to be connected. Mm. It's a great gift. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steph. Um, you talk about love relationships, and I'm, I'm a bit confused at this moment about relationships. I had a very confusing, very um, uh, a relationship that was um, not very satisfying and I ended this relationship and now I wish to have a little bit more a mature and a more um, honest and deeper relationship with the woman but it, lately I had the experience of just meeting someone and, and it was like the rituals that are so deeply ingrained in the culture and I felt like they are so wrong and they are not true and I couldn't bring up my own truth and I just felt like lost because yeah I I, I felt like I was I haven't been honest and on one hand, I would wish to have a... So, Stefan, Stefan, what yeah. if you have a mature and honest, deep relationship with yourself first? That's a challenge. <laughs> Until that, why waste your time anywhere else? You see, you find your exact reflection in your partner, your sexual partner, they will be just as neurotic as you are. They will be just as hung up as you are. So clean up your own act first. Have your own deep, honest, truthful, loving relationship with yourself. Then you don't have to look for it outside. Whatever's appropriate will come to you. You know, this is the problem of our world, as we chase the objects on the outside. In the most gross sense, you have Donald Trump chasing objects that he calls women. Disgusting. But it's really not much different from what everybody else is doing. 
I'm just, I want a deeper, more honest relationship, and I go chasing it. It's like, what you're going to find is your own neurosis mirrored back at you. So why not finish it inside? Why not be so deeply transparent to yourself, so deeply honest with yourself, that you don't need anything else? If you don't need anything else from the outside, if you're already fulfilled, then that's what you will meet. Then you'll meet others who are in the same condition. That's what will be attractive to you, and that's what will attract you to them. Otherwise, what gets attractive is the mating combinations of ego. It's clear? Yes. <laughs> so if you say you have difficulty doing it with yourself, how would you expect to be it easy for doing it with someone else? <laughs> yeah, that's what would be the first step in that, on that path? The first step is you look within. Meet yourself for the first time. Have a first date. See who you are and what you want. See what's real. See what's deep and true and honest. See what isn't. See what's shallow and lying and confused. See, all confusion, Stefan, is a mental state. True love is not confused. But in the mental state of trying to do something, there's suffering. There's confusion. You can't have confusion without thoughts. And as long as you're having thoughts about it, you're not living life, you're living your thoughts. And then you're hormonally attracted to others who will do a mating dance with that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad you called. It makes it very clear for everybody. It's beautiful. Thank you for being honest with us. This was an honest relationship. It's beautiful. It served you and it served us. So thank you for your honesty. Okay, Deborah. Hi, Eli. Hey, Deborah. Mm -hmm. I, um, my heart just wanted to say how much I appreciate what you just said. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've sensed the truth in it. I was divorced a few years ago, and I have not been with anyone um, since then. And I've, there's been a tremendous amount of peace. I mean, largely thanks to you and Gangaji. But um, I guess I've found that my... Um, like I'm more productive and my energy hasn't been spent on the emotional drama that you mentioned. Yes. And I also just really appreciate, you know, you sharing what Papaji said about it, it really being like the drive to, you know, perpetuate the species. And I guess I've had glimpses of that. There, there was some recognition as you were describing it. And I, I just really appreciate that. Hmm. And then, and there's been actually just a lot of contentment without even wanting to, you know, meet someone, um, which I, yeah, I really appreciate your support with that, your Ngangaji support with that in the last few years. Oh, um, so beautiful. But I it. noticed something, sorry, what'd you say? Oh, that's so beautiful. Ah, um, so I noticed something this morning, I happened to see my ex-husband and he mentioned that he was looking to meet someone, um, or mentioned that, you know, he was finding women attractive or something, and and I felt this emotional pang, like it was like, like I felt the emotion, you know, the, the limbic bonding that you mentioned. Yes. And so um, I guess I'm still just kind of being with that. But um, like in moments, I guess, you know, trying to see through it and in other moments feeling completely caught by it, quite honestly. So um, when you're completely caught by it, Deborah, bear it. Don't try to fix it by making it go away, by seeing through it. Just bear it. And you'll find that this, the wounding of the limbic 
bond that you had with your partner and burying it, it burns up and something deeper is revealed. If you try to fix it and make it go away, this is putting a band-aid on it. And maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't. But you can actually use it well. Because you're not going to die from it. And you don't have to do anything about it. It has nothing to do with you. And yet it does because it's your emotional wound. And so the way to use your emotional wound productively is to bear it. Which means you welcome it. Okay, I feel jealous that my partner is now looking at other women. I feel jealous that he wants somebody else. Whatever it is. Whatever the, the words are around it. You bear the pain of it without the story of it. And if you bear it, it's like a fire. It's a limbic fire. And when it burns up, it releases. And in the release... It breaks. And in breaking, there's an openness. When you're completely broken, you're completely open. When you're completely open, you're free. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, um, I was trying to open as you were, I was opening to some degree as you were speaking, and you're absolutely right. It's my emotional wound. Like, what came up for me was, like, you know, I wasn't going to exist. Like, the, the fear of death was basically under the, you know, the jealousy or whatever was on the surface. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Don't stop there. That's so great. When you're willing to bear non-existence, this is completely open. This is complete freedom. If you don't have to be somebody... What a gift that is. That's so rare in this world. Thank you so much, Eli. I'm so glad, Deborah. Thank you so much for your sharing with us. It serves everybody. Mm. Speak to you later. Hillary? Hello, Eli. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, good. <laughs> hmm. um, my quest, I don't know if the right word was, um, I have what everybody keeps telling me, the dream life. And I get that, and um, it is a beautiful place where I live. Um, there is this thing, I, I heard somebody last night telling me, I went to a, um, not me, but telling the crowd, uh, to a, a beautiful kirtan. And um, he said, we, we get everything, but there's one thing that we still want. And we forget all about the others, and we crave this thing. I, I, I don't forget where I am and, and how blessed I am, but this other thing keeps, keeps grasping at me, and I keep at times grasping at it, and that is to have um, a relationship, um, to feel that, that um, companionship, that um, love, that caring, um, and I've been with myself for quite some time, and I, I so, so love myself now, um, and I just wish I could be at peace with this other longing, um, to let it go and let it be all right, just to be with me. Um, it just keeps coming and coming. And uh, life takes me over. And I just love to hear how you can open me up to Hillary? the truth what's really going on here. 
Forget this idea that I know myself and I never forget myself. That's ridiculous. That's a concept you have. What is it when you say this over comes over you and overwhelms you? Who is it that gets overwhelmed? Who gets overwhelmed is this needy person who wants companionship. And I appreciate that. As animals, we're social animals. We, we love having companions, some more than others. And that's the animal instinct. And that's okay. But really, Hillary, what it's driving you to is to have a relationship with yourself, a true one, a deep one, one that is so loving, that is so compassionate, that is so gentle, that is so kind, that you don't need anything else. When you don't need anything else, you will be healed of your neurotic drive for something else. Then you actually will attract what it is you're searching for. You find someone else in the same situation. Otherwise, you're going to find someone else in the same condition that you are. A hungry, needy somebody looking for shelter from the storm. And then the two of you will get together because you have this mutual need and it won't last. That's the experience, right? So eventually, it's beautiful. You say, okay, enough. I don't want to do that again. But just cutting it off and not finishing with yourself. This is what's being called for, Hillary. To surrender deeply into this love of yourself. To be a bride for yourself. To be so pure and holy, so immaculate for yourself, that you're drawn into the depths of yourself. Then you'll have this love affair that you've never experienced in your whole life. A love affair from soul that is so fulfilled, that is so caring and loving, that all the wounds are healed. Then you won't care. If it happens, whatever happens, happens, and it'll be okay. And at that stage, you'll find others that are like that. And then you'll find someone else who is also fulfilled and happy and doesn't care if they ever, because they don't need anybody. Then you'll find a perfect partner. That's my marriage advice. <laughs> Start by marrying yourself. Yes, and 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 uh, a few months ago, I, w I was tested in in that somebody came along and and they were very loving and kind and and I I, I, I think I truly felt I felt felt their soul, um, but they they weren't in that same place, and I actually did let them go because it, it they weren't in the same place. And that, for me, was, yes, a, a learning, and, and much, um... Hillary, where they uh, were... Yeah? Where they were, where that man was, is where you are. He was just as <laughs> needy, he was just as flawed. Yes. He was just as neurotic. And so, you have to be able to start at home. You have to be able to do it for yourself first. Otherwise, what you'll attract is the same thing that you're putting out. That's what we do. Yeah. But how do I do that? I've been okay. sitting with myself for quite some time. Yeah, that's, this is, you're not quite getting it. You believe you already know yourself and you never leave yourself is what you started with. Forget all that. Start with this longing for something else. This longing is a longing for home. Make it your life. Give yourself to this longing. Not for somebody outside yourself, but for the true beloved. Give yourself fully to this longing 
for the beloved. Surrender into yourself. And then you'll find yourself. Then life will begin. Okay? Yes, yes, I Good, do. good. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. I'll see you in a few weeks. Yes, I'll see you soon. Thank you, Eli. Oh, thank you, dear. It's good to hear your voice. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay, one more. Michael from Germany. Hello, Eli. Hey, Michael. Hello. Nice to hear you. Do you hear me? Yeah, sehr gut. Okay, perfect. Um, I have a question. Um, um, you said before to Hillary, um, start by marrying yourself. No? And, uh, and so there are um, questions to me um, like, uh, does it mean uh, renounce to sex or does it mean sit alone at home or does it mean... Um, Michael? What does this mean? It know? means whatever it takes. It means to be willing for whatever it takes. You're already trying to make a deal. <laughs> Should I do this? Mm -hmm. Should I do that? Then I can keep this, so I won't have to do that. Yeah, I want to have a plan. I want to have a yeah. plan or something. You yeah, know? there's no plan. It's whatever it takes. <laughs> mm. Who knows what it will take? Before I went to meet Papaji, I, I examined myself. I didn't know who I was going to find, but I knew I was off to find a teacher, a final teacher. And I had to really examine myself. What am I not willing to give? And I looked at my life. Sexuality, yeah, I can give my sex. I would say chocolate and marijuana were maybe harder than sex. Uh, Everything. I was willing to, I looked at it all. What am I attached to and what am I not willing to give? The only thing I really came up with that I wasn't willing to give was my love for my partner. And then or I really examined it. I said, okay, if it meant her liberation, I could give it. But I couldn't give my love for my partner if it meant my liberation. And of course, when I met my teacher, he said, how can you give up love? It's your nature. And as for the rest, it didn't matter. I told him, you know, Papaji, I smoke grass. And I thought he'd say, okay, stop. And I was willing, okay, I'll stop. He said, oh, so does Shiva. <laughs> I never expected that answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So beautiful, huh? It's better. It's being willing so, for everything. Uh, being willing for everything with no mm -hmm. plan. Then you'll see, you'll see what's required. Whatever the requirement is, you're willing. So sex uh, doesn't, has, uh, doesn't stop, no? doesn't have to stop, but the dependence maybe, no? That's, uh, this is still trying to make a deal about how it's going to work. Who knows? No. Okay, I got it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for being a... Uh, Ah, it's good okay. to hear your voice, dear. Oh, yeah, thank you. Cheers. That's the unfathomable beauty of this surrender to yourself. Is It's not that you have to be celibate, you have to stop this, you can't do that, you have to do this. There are no rules. There's no shoulds. There are no requirements. The only requirement is the willingness for whatever it takes. That's it. You don't know, have to know how to do it. You don't have to know anything except be willing. If you're willing for whatever it takes, this is consciousness as an unstoppable force. If it takes death, so be it. If it takes no sex, so be it. If it takes no relationship, so be it. If it takes poverty, so be it. If it takes wealth, so be it. If it takes more sex, so be it. If whatever it takes. You just put it all as an offering to love and see what love takes. 
see what's required. Who knows? It's a mystery. It's a divine mystery of love. You can't make love, but you can be love. You can't make love, but you can surrender to love. You can't make love, but you can give yourself so fully to love that love eats you, absorbs you. And then, when you're eaten by love, what could you be but love? Then you look out through love's eyes. Then you see the world as love. Man, life begins. This is our time. This is our moment. I'm so glad you're here for this. Thank you, everybody who's on this. We're connected all over the world in this moment, and we all have this same good heart, the same loving truth of ourselves, the same true nature. It's called Buddha nature, awakened consciousness, whatever name you give it, unnameable, unfathomable, timeless and formless. That's what you are. That's who you are. And if you're willing to give yourself to that, you merge into yourself. And then you be yourself, quite naturally. And the world is a better place for it. So, thank you so much for being here. May all beings be happy and free. <laughs>